So, hi everyone, and welcome to this week's Orchestrator Weekly. Uh, looking at the topics, we have a presentation from Adam regarding the agent. Adam, do you want to start? Uh, yeah. Right, uh, I'll share my screen. So um, I'm going to present a little bit about the agent. I think most people in here actually already know most of the stuff. But uh, anyway, I'm going to go over it, uh, sort of why we're doing it, what the architecture is going to be for it, some of the like important issues with it. So to start, uh, why? Why do we need this agent? So the main thing here is for scalability and performance. Uh, so for one on here, we have SSH is currently the only way we really communicate with any of the hosts. And we've seen that that's pretty slow. Um, and so like we have our serve loop and we go through and we try to SSH into every single host to do everything. It, it just takes too long and um, we can't keep up with everything. Uh, for parallelization, so right now, um, right we're just parallelizing the metadata gathering. But in the future, there could be maybe if you want to deploy a lot of OSPs, you want to do that in parallel. Just tell all the agents what they have to do and they could go do it. You don't have to worry about going through each host individually one at a time in the serve loop doing that. And also it's a push model, so it saves the manager the work of having to go explicitly going and gathering all these things. All it has to do is sit back, have its uh, HTTP server up, and it'll get the metadata sent to it. And also the other reason we need this is responsiveness. Specifically, we're talking about uh, HA for NFS here. Um, when I remember, uh, NFS, need, we need to know if it's down within a minute. And so if we have the serve loop and it only goes off every few minutes, that's already too slow. And even then, if it went off once a minute, um, it still takes a while to go to SSH into the host and gather the metadata. So it's just it's too slow. We can't do any HA for NFS with the uh, current architecture. So why well, we need some sort of agent on the host to make things faster. Okay, so the basic architecture here is that the manager itself is going to have an HTTP endpoint. Uh, we're using Cherry Pi for that. Uh, because we're working with, um, or we're worried about scalability and stuff, we want to be able to take HTTP requests from a lot of different places. We really want to have like a nice library here. We don't want to have to like have our own um, HTTP server. We have to you know, worry about debugging and everything. Uh, this one's already built. We have to implement it in here. And then for the hosts themselves, the agent will be a non-containerized systemd unit. It allows it to run commands directly on the host really easily. So what we'll see in the other slides is like all the metadata needs to gather. It's easy to just run on the host without it being in a container. Um, and what the, it'll be doing is it'll be sending all the things it gathers over HTTP to the manager on that server that it has waiting here. And then for messages from the manager to the agent, we have a raw socket. Uh, we don't really want to have to have an HTTP server running on every single host agent, so we just have a socket to communicate. It should be enough there. You see here, we've set it up so we can today uh, receive a variable on JSON string, which basically lets us send whatever we want to it. Um, which will help in the future if you want to extend the functionality. Uh, so what we'll do uh, for now, we're just getting meta metadata because um, we're worried about the responsiveness and um, the scalability stuff. Right now, the biggest scale problem is actually gathering metadata in the serve loop. It just takes a while because most other things you only have to do once in a while. You only have to deploy daemons usually like once on each host or whatever. Um, but metadata you have to gather all the time. So we, this is the first thing we want to have the agent do. So I have a list here of all the things it's currently set up together. Um, so a list of daemons, like this is the important stuff um, for, there's one of the slowest things that runs, like the LS is super slow. And so the agent will do that. It'll send it to the manager. So it already has it ready. Uh, we have the networks and host facts in here. This is just some information about the hosts that could be useful. Um, so the networks is, is pretty useful. And then set volume output. This is helpful too for the disks. Right now we don't even refresh that very often. Um, so this will make that faster. We'll have more up-to-date info on the disk on the host. And in the future, I think we can even set it up so if the disk change, um, we'll immediately can have the agent send more data. Um, so we'll be really responsive on that stuff. And maybe more in the future. So right now, it's just the metadata stuff, but we've talked about uh, the possibility of uh, once this is a stable thing, uh, maybe we wanted to deploy demons. It could help with um, deploying a lot of OSDs or whatever. Um, but that, that's future work. You don't want to go there until this is how other stuff works. Uh, so I'm going to talk about some of the bigger issues with the agent, things that we're worried about. Um, so the first one, and one of the more important ones, is security. 
So we're talking about uh, having a secure channel here for because we're doing things over HTTP and also the raw socket. Um, the things we're worried about are making sure the messages are encrypted and then making sure we're authenticating who's sending them. So if we have messages that can't be sniffed by anyone, you can't read them at all, at all, and also we know exactly who they're coming from and who we're sending things to, then we have a pretty secure uh, channel of communication. Um, so in this case, we have two channels we're worried about. So for the HTTP messages, uh, that's things going from the agent to the server. Like when we send um, metadata up there, we do it with a post request. And so we have to make sure that's secure. And then also the raw socket, the manager, or not the, the agent itself has a, the raw socket, and the manager needs to be able to send information to that socket. Uh, again, it needs to be secure. We need to make sure that when we're sending something to the agent, it's actually the agent. And the agent needs to make sure what gets from the manager is actually coming from the manager. You can't just have anyone sending things to it. First, talk about that HTTP channel. Um, so first, we need to set up HTTPS. Um, so we have encryption. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't seem like there's any native two-way authentication in Cherry Pie for SSL. So we um, can't. That would be the ideal way to do it, but we can't quite do that. Um, we'll get back to that in a second. Um, so first of all, what we're doing here is we're having the manager generate a root cert um, for us to use for this uh, HTTP server. And then once we have the root cert set up, we can generate another cert that's signed by that root cert that we can use for SSL on the manager. And then what we do once we have that is we uh, give that to the agent when we're deploying it. That's done over SSH. We're not as worried about um, any encryption or anything over that. And then once, since the agent has its root cert, it's able to use that to verify the manager. I can see that the cert the manager is using is one that's signed by this. It'll also check the host name on that, that um, certification the manager has. That way it knows that who it's sending data to is, in fact, the actual manager. It's not just some random person. And the manager also verifies the agent. Um, so we don't have two-way authentication, so we can't verify some sort of SSL cert on the agent side. So we have to come up with a different way of doing it. So what we do is we generate a key ring for the agent, and then when the agent sends metadata back to the manager, it includes that key ring, and we verify that the agent on that host is supposed to have that exact key ring. And if it doesn't, we just discard it, whatever it sends. But if it does, we can use that metadata to be sure that it's from someone reliable. On the other side, the raw socket. This is just a raw socket. We don't have any problems with uh, not being allowed to use two-way authentication, so that's what we're doing here. Um, the nice thing about this is it covers both the encryption and the authentication. So it's a similar thing. We have that root cert on the manager that we generated, uh, but this time we're actually generating a cert for the agent itself. Um, so on top of passing the root cert uh, to the agent, we also are passing this new generated cert to the agent. And then now the manager and the agent both have their own certifications. Um, and so they can verify each other's cert. So the manager will verify the agent has a um, certification signed by that root cert, and the agent can verify the manager's certification is also signed by that root cert. Since we're the ones making the root cert, and we're the ones only passing that stuff around, we can say if both sides have a cert signed by our newly created root cert, then we're pretty sure that this is like a legit request from someone in the cluster. And again, because it's uh, SSL, it's already all the encryption's already covered. Okay. Another big topic we had was the metadata integrity. Specifically here, it's about um, things being out of date. So before what we were doing is um, in our serve loop, we'd gather the metadata first, and then we'd say apply specs or whatever. Um, but now we're doing that all asynchronously, so we have to be concerned about when we go to the serve loop, we want to apply a spec. Is the metadata actually up to date is reliable? Um, that can be an issue because um, if it's not uh, up to date, you could double deploy a daemon. So if you've deployed, say, a monitor on a host, and then you rented to the serve loop, started up again, and you didn't have new metadata from the host, you might still think there's only there's no monitor there or whatever. And you could try to deploy it again. You don't want to have double daemons going on hosts. I think it's more of a problem with, I don't know if monitor specifically is a problem, but it's just a problem in general with um, extra daemons getting deployed. And so our solution to this is just a counter. Um, essentially, we're originally thinking of something like a LAMP port clock, but I looked at it some more, and this problem is a bit simpler than what a LAMP port clock can cover. Um, a LAMP port clock, you have a full queue, and there's counter values in that queue, and you can use it to verify our, uh, access distributed resources across a bunch of different hosts. But in our case, they really only have one issue, which is verifying two specific events, which order they happened in on two specific hosts, so it's super simple. And it's because we can use a counter. And the way the counter essentially works is 
the manager is in control of actually incrementing the counter at any point. So it has this counter value, and then whenever it changes in the hosts that are on any given, or demons that are on any given host, it just updates that counter value. Then from that point on, it only will accept metadata, um, or will only consider the host metadata up to date if it receives metadata with that counter value. Uh, so we just send that new counter value to the agent, and what the agent will do is Whenever it's about to start gathering metadata, it will um, see what its counter value is, and it'll make sure it attaches that to the message. That way, the, um, if the host gets metadata with the counter value, the new counter value, it knows that not only did the agent like see that counter value and put it in, but that saw the counter value before it even started gathering the metadata, which guarantees that the metadata is newer than the last time we, um, we deployed demons on that host which is essentially the same verification we have for our current setup, so we're not losing any sort of metadata integrity there, um, which is good because that was one of the big problems with this asynchronous push model system. Um, offline hosts, this is another thing. This is the big thing with like the HA for NFS stuff is we need to be able to detect offline hosts quickly. Um, so we're just doing a timeout here. Uh, currently, I have it set to being two and a half times the refresh rate of the agent, which I think is defaulting to 20 seconds. So essentially, if it's been 50 seconds and we haven't gotten a message from uh, any agent, then that host will get considered offline. And if that happens, then we know hey, we have to move a daemon around um, if you want to like have some sort of HA system. Um, and then what we do in that case is we simply just schedule a redeploy of the down agent. Um, the reason we do that is because it helps with two things. One, it can verify those is actually offline because we will try to SSH in to deploy the agent and or redeploy the agent. And so if the host is, act, is not actually offline, we'll, we'll be able to tell because we'll go to SSH in and see that. Um, and if the host is offline, then we won't. And we'll know for sure it's offline. And it also helps that if the agent just has an issue and maybe redeploying could fix it. So we can also um, fix the problem we have if it's not actually an offline host. So um, that way offline hosts are sort of handled. Um, they can be handled quicker than they are currently with the, the serve loop. Um, I'm just going to mention here, this is still a work in progress. I have this pull request uh, open still. I'm not going to open it right now, but it, it's, it's there. Um, I actually just ran through a tautology run uh, last night. There's some problems with SSL on Ubuntu. So there's still things to be ironed out if you are interested in going and looking at it and reviewing it themselves. Um, I'm going to give a small demo. I Hopefully this cluster is actually up. I started up a cluster like right before this meeting. And I don't know if it's all here, but we're going to check. There's not much to show um, because the agent doesn't really add new functionality. It just makes things supposedly like run quicker than before a performance thing. But we can see here. What? The refresh column is nice and small. Yeah, this is really where it um it helps. So you can see here we have three agents deployed. I have three hosts, DM0001 and 02. And there's some demons on these hosts, just the default demons if you have the monitoring stack stuff on. And you can see if I run this again, like say it got up, like um, these already all got reset. They're not all in sync anymore. It's just because whenever the agents have to send data, and they really only get up to like 20 something seconds before they'll send something back. So you see it's always kept super slow or a uh, super small amount of time. Uh, in between refreshes, that way we can always tell. Um, if things are always up to date, we can see things faster. We'll be able to detect offline hosts faster. Um, and that's really all there is to show for this stuff. I guess I can show these debug logs. You can see here um, that we have messages about receiving. This is probably super small, actually. Um, Anyway, if you can't read this, it says um, it refreshed the host VMO on demons. Um, they have a message about how we received up-to-date metadata from host VMO one, and then there's just this automatically printed message about a HTTP message being sent. Um, but basically, that's all it really is to show, again, because there's no new functionality here. We can see that the refresh time is super low, um, which is the whole goal of this, and that the agents are able to run. I said this is on a CentOS set of VMs. It seems to be problems with Ubuntu currently, but uh, it'll get ironed out. And I think that's really it, um, unless anyone has any questions they want to ask. Yeah, awesome. Awesome. Thank you, Adam. Okay. Um, I have 
Questions? Sanj, you as well? Uh, nope, nope, I just think it looks great. Um, so, um, so three questions. Um, um, the, the one is uh, for large clusters, uh, maybe a thousand hosts or more. Are we going to kill and overload the manager by pushing metadata so often? Um, I think it, it should be able to handle it. The Cherry Pie can have a lot of different threads running at once, and it doesn't take very long to handle the individual metadata once it's there. Like the actual processing of it seems really quick. I think the gathering is the slow part. So I want to say it should be able to handle that stuff, at least a lot better than it's currently being handled uh, with the SSH and stuff. So I think it'll be OK. Obviously, it's going to have to get, get tested. Um, mm -hmm. I th I'm optimistic about it. OK. Yeah. Um. Okay. Um, so when when we are going out of the one minute timeout in a large cluster, are we ending up in a threshing situation where we are creating even more t more? Imagine imagine the um, the manager is locked for a minute or so for whatever reason. I don't know. Um, and the uh, push, um, the, the agents pushing information to the manager. And if that takes longer than a minute, we are ending up in a timeout and uh, starting to run to use SSH. Are we ending up in a threshing situation by uh, causing even more timeouts by uh, falling back to SSH? I mean, that hope would just be to avoid that at all, just have it not take that much longer. I think we could maybe work with adjusting the how fast we time it out or anything, if that's a problem. And also, we're in the future, we want to get it so it can run, the agent can run a bit faster, and so it can push um, off without having any being slowed down. Um, but then there's no real way around it, I think, where if you're going to have something like this, if you put the timeout, it, like it, if it takes too long, it, then it has to time it out. There's nothing else really to do. Um, so I think that we really have to just do is work towards making it so that the agent can always get its request accepted in that timeout range. I'm not sure there's any other way to move forward with it. When uh, if the manager fails over, it has to redeploy all the agents, right? Yeah, they do have to get reconfigured. I thought about as some sort of future work. Um, it was possible to do that reconfiguration over the, the HTTP with like the socket. Right now, it's just doing the um, SSH thing we have built in because that's what we have. I didn't want to try to implement that in this basic version, but that's at least something to go for afterwards to see if I if it's just a simple reconfigure. It's not it need to change that much. If I just want to change, say, the target IP of the manager, um, maybe we can send an HTTP message to it and it can just fix it. We could also imagine. Yeah, we could also imagine that the um, the agents learn what the standby managers are every time they send in their data, so that um, if they're having trouble connecting, they could try one of the standbys and then they sort of seamlessly transition. Yeah, that's also a pretty good idea. I've even thought of that having the standby managers kept as um, by the agent. We could try that as well. Nice future work. It seems like I'm going back to the thrashing question. It seems like maybe the way to avoid that is. Um, and the, the issue is that the manager is like, ah, five of the agents have timed out. So I have a list of these five agents, and I iterate over them. And each iteration is like this 20-second process of like doing the slow stage connection, whatever it is. And then you end up like redeploying agents that are no longer slow. Um, so maybe like structuring that loop so that um, we check and see if there is a slow agent. And if so, we take one of them and redeploy it. Then we start over and we check again if we have slow agents. Because in the meantime, while we were doing that work, they might have phoned in. The other ones might have phoned in or whatever. 
Okay. So like bail out of the serve loop if we redeploy one of those agents like that. Yeah, and just like start over. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, just do one right. thing and then reevaluate. And yeah, we'll have to see, I guess, what the actual effects are with speed and stuff, but that's definitely an option. It'll at least it would lower the amount of thrashing. It would only redeploy one of them. Yeah. Um, quick question. So you're using on the agent side, you're using the standard library for Python, which means Gorilla two or whatever. That yeah, just send the request. You you have to ask for that specifically. Yeah. On the phone. Yeah. That changed from the the Python three request to the URL that. I was just surprised that that that, that, that can do all the SSL like or whatever stuff, but it can. You can do a. Yeah, you can do um like the client can verify the the servers with that library. Cool. I guess the one last thought. Um, the since both since it's a cert for both the client and for the server. Um, I wonder if that whatever the agent the agent cert piece of it can be used in place of like generating a, a suffix key for each of the agents. Yeah, the only reason I thought I needed the key ring is just because the cherry pie server doesn't do the two way. Like for the talking to the raw socket, I can just use the two-way authentication yeah. and the SL cert, but when I want to verify the agent from the manager side when it sends metadata over, um, I can't, it doesn't seem like I can use a verified cert, yeah. like Sherry won't let me, so I needed the key right. ring. So, so I get that, but because of that, you're just sending some other thing, some other just like key, in this case you're using the key ring, but you could okay. use the, the cert for that same purpose. Are you saying just send the cert over and just verify the cert manually? Yeah, or or not even like verify the cert, but just use the the cert or like the hash of the cert or something as the authentication piece okay. instead of having a separate key ring. Since yeah, you already have yeah. a piece of data that's that's agent specific. Yeah, I could do that. Way. I just store the certs somewhere and then. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm just thinking that we'll have a bunch of key rings for agents. I guess that's not really a problem because we have key rings for everything, but. Yeah, yeah, we can look into that again as like a future thing. Maybe it yeah. saves us one piece of data to send over. Yeah, not, not a big deal in any case. Looks pretty good to me. Sounds great. OK, anything else regarding the agent? Nothing. OK, then let's move over to repaving OSTs. Yeah, Corey. so uh, this is Corey. I yeah, jumped on. just wanted to kind of get uh, some tips and stuff, I guess, so far today uh, for how you guys imagine it being envisioned. From my standpoint, I guess, uh, what I've looked at so far and how I see it is Basically, you guys already have some utility functions for determining whether an OSD is safe to destroy. So I imagine I just uh, look for ones that are safe to destroy and have a queue of them uh, and destroy them as possible based upon the requirements of maintaining the replication factor and stuff. Um, and then use your standard commands, the same ones that end up being used if you were to do it manually to replace them watch for them to be drained, and then I guess it would take care of zapping them as well. One of the questions I have then is after they're zapped, do you know, just let the existing machinery handle redeploying it, like based on labels and stuff, or what all needs to be done after they've already been destroyed and we need to bring it back up? You can certainly imagine a situation where there's an existing drive group defined that would cover those newly um, evacuated devices, zap devices, um, in which case you wouldn't have to do anything. Um, then you, you, if, if there was already a drive group that would slurp up the devices as they became available, then you just basically need to have the logic to identify which ones are candidates, the ones that want need to be repaved, and then wait until it's safe to do so. 
probably the easiest way to do it. If it's if you don't have that, if they don't have an existing drive group, then you'd have to have some special logic to like identify the free device and then deploy it. But I feel like feels like that's the drive group. <laughs> You're duplicating the drive group functionality if you want to do that. So yeah. Um, there is a device ID. Maybe we can craft a specific drive group for that specific device ID. Yeah, we could do that. I mean, we could make those, yeah. yeah. But it seems like if we did that, then you would start out with, say you have 10 deployed OSDs and you have no drive groups defined, and you run this process. If we did that, then at the end of the, when you're totally done, you would then have 10 drive, drive groups, each of which is like specific device, which is kind of a gross state to end up in, all these like one-off drive groups. I don't know how common this um, scenario is, what the repave OSDs are, exactly what like, user scenario we're trying to cover here, but it seems like if we if we just said that in order for this to work properly, you have to have a drive group defined that will cover the devices as it becomes available, then like that would sort of make our life easier and would also nudge users easier to manage. Um, Conry, what what was your use case again? I, I think it was uh, changing a min allocation size, right? Yeah, yeah, that's the big one. And sorry, my uh, headphones seemed to cut out there for a little bit, so I missed some of what you're saying. No, did you guys hear what I said originally? Originally, yes. Originally, yes. Okay, good. Um, but yes, uh, the the big use case for us is to change the min allocation size across a bunch of clusters that are pretty big. And then we just had another use case uh, that we ended up doing manually where we wanted to start using DB wall on uh, some OSDs that weren't previously configured to use DB wall uh, on NVMEs. Um, yeah, um, would be the thing to do there. Mm. Um, Guillaume, do, we, we have this already in Sefensible, right? A, a way yeah. to kind of repave OSDs. In this case, it was from from, from Firestore to Bluestore. Well, in Sefensible, um, the workflow is pretty basic, let's say. Uh, it's more uh, a first playbook you have to run to, to shrink the OSD and then you basically redeploy. Mm. Oh, the which which Blue Star playbook was not really intended to do this actually. So, um, but I think the the problems or edge cases we have to cover are kind of similar. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you remember which weird edge cases or, or complicated situations you had to? think of or, or fix later on so that we're not ending up with uh, similar problems? Uh, well, the worst case was more about safe disk based OSDs because of, of Nautilus, we don't have any more the safe disk CLI, so it was quite challenging to get details on OSDs and stuff like this, so it was mainly because of safe disk. I think we are still supporting safe disk OSDs that are that were created by. Yeah, we make safe volume take over safe disk OSDs, but we can't deploy new OSDs with safe disk, obviously. Mm -hmm. Um, Corey, do, do you want to at least have a look at that Firestore to Bluestore um, 
Ansible playbook in order for, for us to avoid running into the same issues? Yeah, I'm sure it wouldn't hurt. So if you guys have a link. Yeah, that's that part, of the, part of the <laughs> other pad. Um, what, what else? Uh, do, do we need to add some persistent state for us to track what's the current state of repaving OSDs? Seems like if we're able to re <clears throat> rely on the drive groups for redeploying once the devices are free, then we wouldn't really. We could just identify victim and then procedurally stop the daemon, stop the devices, like <laughs> go back to the top of the loop. I mean, drive groups don't share the information like, or don't don't store persistent information like, this OC should be repaved. Right, but the drive group is just a, like a pattern match that says I should deploy, if I see this, right? So as soon as the device is, Depth, then drive group should pick it up. Mm. Um, <clears throat> but what happens if we have a failover uh, while the OSD is being drained? A drain does not necessarily follow. It's going to be followed up with a with a with a zap. Well, the drain is stateful, I guess, right? Like there's already state about which OSDs are being drained. Mm -hmm. So maybe maybe what you actually want is just a flag on the drain process that says when, maybe we already have this actually, that when we're done draining, then we should adapt the devices. Actually, so maybe the gap then, the drain also has this thing where um, there are two modes, one where you're going to reuse the ID, OSD ID and one where you're not. Maybe we need to uh, have a way so that when we're zapping and the drive group applies, it notices that it knows that it should reuse the OSD ID. Mm. Um, re reusing the OSD ID is pretty simple. We are just when creating OSDs, you are just searching for those DIDs that are marked as destroyed. That one is pretty easy. Does it just pick any one that's destroyed that's on the same host? Is that the idea? Uh, I think so. Okay. So maybe that's maybe we have to do anything there. So which, which means that this, this should actually be pretty easy. I guess <clears> to reuse. Have, sorry, the one other concern I have is that if you have a drive group that says, so say you have servers that have like eight hard disks and one SSD or two SSDs or whatever they get put up in the DB wall partitions, and you do, um, and if everything's empty and you have the drive group that says use this for wall and this for data or whatever, that volume like figures out that the SSD should be divided eight ways. Um, but if you delete, if you zap like one of the OSDs, so one of the data devices, and you delete one of the LVs for the, the DB wall, we need to make sure that the volume is, or whatever is, yeah, that is smart enough to like know to recreate the DB LV that's the right size. We did just test something like that on a Pacific cluster, and it seemed to work because there was somebody on the mailing list who had claimed that that wasn't working. So we kind of set it up in a lab and tested it. It seems to be working, but we can verify that again, too. That Yeah. I think that's just a, a key test case that we'd want to make sure that cover. Mm -hmm. um, in the Ceph ADM test suites, we don't testing it. We are relying on the Cephalium test suites to properly do that. Yep. 
Uh, Guillaume, do you know if that's properly tested? Um, honestly, I would not bet on that at the moment. I don't think so, to be honest. Okay, which means that we might need to do it because we are really mm -hmm. relying on that functionality. Yep. Yeah. That's a bit tricky because uh, the normal Smithy machines like don't really have devices that let us do that anyway. Like we need a we probably need a separate set of machines that we run those sorts of Smithian tests. So as far as the uh, command to kick this off, and sorry if you guys talked about this when my headphones were disconnected, but um, do you, ima you imagine a new command like Ceph OSD repave kind of thing, and then they specify in some kind of uh, with some kind of wildcard syntax, or I don't know what do you what do you imagine the input to select the set of OSTs that should be repaved, I guess, or just a whole uh, host spec. Something like that. Seems like you need some condition. I don't know. I mean, maybe. I mean, maybe it's just a. I don't know. Because you want to make sure that if you repave something. That it, it gets removed from the list, you don't repave it again. Mm -hmm. um, you could imagine that, like, there's some reason why you want to repave, and so there's some condition that you're checking on every OSD, but like, imagining what all those things are going to be for users is maybe um, a fool's errand because we don't know what the reasons might be. Um, so maybe the middle ground would just be that. You tell it repave this OSD and this OSD and this OSD, and it puts them in a queue. Um, and if we did that, if we would just had a queue of that, then we got to we shouldn't use the OSD ID to do it, but the, um, the, maybe the OSD UID. Okay. We destroy the OSD that goes away and it gets redone. It'll come back with a new one, new UID. Hmm. Makes sense. So maybe. And then add a list of UIDs that we want to repave. That might be one way to do it. And then that list of OSDs that needs to be repaved after the command is initially submitted and needs to be stored on the monitors in case yeah. the manager goes down and stuff. Ooh. Yeah. That should be pretty straightforward. And then you just look at the list and you'd say, does this OSD still exist? If not, then remove it from the list. <laughs> if it does still exist, is it safe to destroy? If so, then do it. Um, yeah, that makes sense. Or maybe, I don't even know if safe to destroy is quite right, because you basically want to, it won't be safe to destroy in general. You just want to, you want to start draining it. So maybe you say, are we draining any OSDs currently? If not, then take the first one on the list, train that one. I think, I Do you think just one at a time then, always? I, I mean, that's probably the safest thing because then you don't have to worry about like overloading the, the cluster, but it would be slower, certainly. Maybe start with that at least and then leave room for optimization at that, that piece. That might be maybe just yeah, that's, that might be just a good starting point, right? I think before, um, when we talked about this like two years ago, the okay. the strategy we thought of was that if you're gonna repave, like when you it's, it's the the complicated part is when you have these hybrid OSDs where you have the SSD and four hard disks that are whatever you're using the SSD as the DB, like you basically want to repave that whole set of um, devices. The SSD and the paired hard, drive, hard disks all as like a, a unit. 
they'd want to like destroy all those OSDs and then redeploy that whole thing as a set. Um, sure. Maybe that isn't necessary because Polymer is smart enough that you could do them one at a time. Be nice. But there are probably cases where you do want to do all of them because, for example, maybe they're Ceph. Well, we don't really care about I don't even know if we support Ceph disk well enough that we should worry about it. Um, so I don't know. Yeah. For a big cluster, I imagine it's going to take a lot longer to do one at a time because basically you're shuffling all the data off and then shuffling it all back on. Yeah. individually versus if you do a bunch at once, you just have one shuffle each time, right? You so the mod map isn't, the OSD map, the crush map isn't changing every single OSD versus, you know what I mean? It'll be, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's probably, there'd be less data movement if you do a bunch at a time, but it'll right. be a yeah. higher impact on cluster. Yeah. I'd be inclined to just start with something really simple and we can always. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Corey, that okay for you? to start working on that top on that uh, project yeah yeah i think so let me uh yeah I'll, I'll take it back and kind of sketch it out more and stuff and then uh, i'll come back with more questions for next time and stuff probably or things that uh you might need a second pair of eyes something but that was really helpful thank you and it, it seems to me like the sort of the most important piece is whether if you have that that ssd hard disk combination and you just do one remove one OSD and one of the like DB LVs or whatever, if the reader, mm -hmm. uh, it might be worth retesting that situation just to verify that it'll do the right thing. Okay. Yep. I would like a note to do that. And I guess one last thing. So as far as backporting it, you imagine this being backported to Pacific and then Octopus, yes or no? Octopus, probably not. But Pacific, yes. Probably, unless it ends up being yeah. disrupted for some reason. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. Cool. Awesome. Mm, I, I forgot something from when, when talking about the agent. Um, how fast do we need to file over NFS scanner demons in order for clients to properly uh, experience HA? So the, the grace period is 90 seconds. Mm -hmm. um, I would say that we probably want to do the failover by the midpoint of that, if we can, um, so that they'll have plenty of time to go through their thing mm. um adam the the agents are pushing data every 20 seconds or so or in every every half a minute yeah uh, a little bit of work needs to be done so it actually pushes every 20 seconds um because right now it's 20 seconds plus time it takes to gather which i want to fix in a follow-up um but it should be every 20 seconds once that's um Pretty close to be 50 seconds. It'd probably be about a minute before. That's probably still good enough in like a healthy environment. So maybe we can just go with that. And we can make the um, the agent interval like tunable too. So if somebody has like really tight NFS requirements or something, they could like the agent go into overdrive. We also, um, I have a config setting right now for the cluster overall, but you also, if we wanted to, we could deploy individual ones with different settings. We could say, like, NFS host wanted to have slightly faster ones or something. That would be doable. Yeah.
Okay. That's what I wanted to make sure, that we are actually be able to hit the target for NFS because it was one of the main reasons for doing that. Um, okay, next topic I had on my list was um, testing reboots. We, we had a bad issue where um, ones got removed from the mon map when rebooting hosts. And that's kind of evil. And we really probably should avoid running into the same issue again. Um, Sage, you mentioned that we have a power cycle thresher and a kernel task with what we could use to test reboots. Yes, the the Thrasher, and I think the code actually lives in Ceph Manager, um, does reboot nodes. Oh, it power cycles nodes, um, which should have the same effect. <laughs> so we could actually do a full on power cycle, or we could go SSH and run reboot. But I haven't checked to see whether there's any trick you have to do to like properly. Um, Anyone else using the power cycle pressure? Yeah, I think actually, I don't think it does anything fancy. It just literally power cycles it. And then the, in the log, you'll see some retries as it like tries to do its stuff <laughs> and eventually it'll recover. Yes. There is a power cycle suite. UI suite's power cycle. Yep. Yep. So I bet we could actually just, you know, exec reboot. <laughs> that would work. Anyway, it oh, okay. can take a little experimenting, but I think it should be fine. Okay. Uh, another thing that did pop up last week was log aggregation. Um, th there is a demand for Cephalium to kind of make it possible to aggregate logs from all over the cluster, um, possibly for support cases or so, I don't know. Um, I kind of was a bit hesitant to um, add functionality to the CFAD manager module to aggregate logs from all over the cluster because they are huge or might be huge. Um, what can we do if we really have to implement this? Um, what what ideas do you have to um, aggregate logs from all over the cluster? Um, we we know that Ansible is the wrong tool for the job. Uh, Guillaume, you've uh, looked looked into that already, and it's unreliable. Yep, in which responsible we experienced issues with this. Yeah, which which means that Ansible is really the wrong tool for the job. Yep. What else can we do? It seems like one of the big questions is like, where do you want to aggregate them, right? Like Does it even make sense? Is like the SOS report type of thing where you're like something went wrong and I just want to over up a bunch of logs, court case or something, then like, where where do I want to put them? Mm -hmm. um, do we really have to put them onto the Active Manager? I mean, the Active Manager is the only one that has the SSH key. I guess you can make the CLI go talk to the manager to get the key so that it uses to connect all the remote hosts. But, um, I 
I don't know. It feels a bit ill-defined because, like, do you want to gather all logs? Do you want to gather, like, just the manager logs? Do you want to do whatever? Um, all logs. All logs for everything. We are doing it on, in Cardology already. We are um, SSH. Yeah. We are running SSH on the remote host and then aggregating all daemon logs and putting it into a zip file. Seems like maybe then you would want something like Ethereum um, gather all logs um, and then like get key from manager. <laughs> And you would run this on some host and then like directory. Where are they going to go? Or maybe you would, you'd always do this actually. So this would it just do active manager to get a host list and key. But what I really want to avoid is using the manager module to aggregate logs because that feels just wrong. Manager module shouldn't be yeah. in the realm of transferring a lot of data. Yeah, that's why I think it should be a video command like itself. You run. So you like CD. One point. Uh, do you think that really is important or is interesting to have all the logs in the same file or in a TIFF file? Maybe it could be useful for uh, well, uh, forensic <laughs> diagnosis, okay? But when you have a problem in a cluster, uh, probably this is not the kind of, uh, of log that you want to use. Uh, I think that uh, well, there are uh, external tools that are specialized in analyzing logs is, is another issue, okay? So I I think that it could be useful, for example, for integration tests to, to have uh, all the information after the test, but in running clusters or in production systems, I think that to have everything uh, or to have an aggregation of the logs, just an aggregation of the logs, is not going to be useful. That, that, that now we're back to the LK, ELK stack or EFK stack. Yeah. It's, a, it's um, a different product in my in my view, okay? And to provide the just the possibility to, to put together all the logs, I think that uh, well, a step for forensic analysis is not is not very useful. But the ELK and log aggregation thing did come up in the past already, already years ago. Um, and we never had a proper answer. I was going to yeah, say, from, from our side at Island, we have log, log aggregation set up with uh, Promptail and Loki. And I know there are other alternatives, solutions with Oak Stacks and stuff, but that seems to be pretty straightforward to set up, and those tools already exist. So, to me, I don't, at least from our standpoint, like it's easy enough to use those external tools for the log aggregation and making them searchable and indexed and stuff uh, for all of these purposes. And I'm not sure what advantage there is to having specific support for it and stuff, I guess, besides maybe being convenient and easier to set up right away. Maybe we can just document it, setting up a uh, prompt or a LK stack and just don't do any coding ourselves. I don't know. I mean, it seems but like it's still... also aren't mutually exclusive, right? Like some users will want a full blown elk stack. Mm -hmm. um, but having like a gather logs tool might also be.
And maybe we want to teach Cephidium how to deploy Elk 3FK or whatever. Maybe not. I don't know. I don't know what the demand is. Yeah, it's a. Uh, I don't know. I, I really don't like uh, going into the realm of gathering log files. It it feels to me that Cephidium is really the wrong tool for the job. And it feels that we are that we're going to invest a lot of time to implement this for a rather limited benefit. Well, I think just having a, a simple command isn't a whole lot. I mean, it's narrowly scoped. It's not a whole lot of effort. It doesn't have to be part of Cephidium. You could imagine just writing a quick little script that does the same thing, but just taking that functionality and putting it inside Cephidium, the CLI tool at least. Seems nice because I think that lots of people will I'm not yeah, I'm not wild about supporting full EFK type of deal. Mm -hmm. Anyway. Anyway, thank you. And we are out of time. Thanks for joining. Um, if there is nothing super urgent, I would say let's let's call it a meeting and see you next week. <laughs>